doctor doesn't have a good report. So he went in before his son in the hospital room and he said, first of all, he read a lot of scriptures. He read a lot of scriptures about heaven, about God. Then they prayed together. Then he said, son, the doctor has given me a bad report. And uh, I'm not going to have you long. You're, uh, you're going to be leaving me. You probably won't make it. Are you afraid to meet God, son? He said, no, Dad, I'm not afraid to meet God. If, if God's like you, I'm not afraid to meet God. Aren't you glad that we're going to meet him who is full of mercy, full of grace, full of not afraid to meet you this morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated, Brother uh, Lewis is going to come and read. It wasn't that wonderful teaching yesterday by Brother Lewis. Brother Lewis, we thank you for that wonderful, wonderful lesson. God bless you. Thank you for those kind remarks, Brother Give Rose. And it's a joy to gather together. Isaiah 53, if you'd like to turn, join with us this morning, this week. I was just thinking there, and I shouldn't take long to elaborate on anything, but one of the things that makes me under confident of the inspired Word of God is that sometimes the writers, in fact, quite often, they didn't comprehend the fullness of what they were speaking about. But nonetheless, it was truth that was emanating from the very heart of God as he was projecting himself through writers to speak things that were long in the distance to be fulfilled, yet they were fulfilled in minute detail. So he says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor commonness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every man to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her sharers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit 
in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and, they are, and made intercession for the transgressors. As we progress through that chapter this morning, I see the artist as he begins to make the stroke upon the canvas, and there emerges a beautiful picture of personified mercy and love. Let's lay our hands and praise him this morning. Wonderful God, we want to thank you for such love that caused you to bring to bear upon the family of man such wonderful things as we enjoy in this very day. We are forever indebted to you. We are forever indebted to you for your mercy and love that is so powerful and great. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Brother Lewis. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is a uh, real privilege to be with you this morning and uh, to be working with Brother Lewis. I, uh, my wife is related to the Lewises, and every time I see a Lewis, I always say I love the Lewises. Love the Lewises. Man, I have to. They're precious, and thank God for our relationship. He did a wonderful message yesterday on relationships with each other. How can you love God whom you have not seen unless you love your brother whom you can see? He read a verse of scripture from Isaiah 53. And uh, the text for this Bible study this morning is in the second verse. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34, the verses that give us the history of the death of Moses tells us that there was, there rose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. The world observes a lot of uh, enthusiasm that we have and uh, emotions that we have about the Lord. We all have a desire to win the world, but our obsession is to win Christ. And through winning the world, we want to win Christ.
there are many songs that have been written about the face of Jesus. I know that we all desire, I feel like it is a common desire among God's people to see Jesus face to face. Because at the end of our race is his face. And we are focusing on his face. I have an elder preacher friend up in Indiana, Brother Simerson, who is 84 years old. And my wife and I preached six revivals for them. And down through the years, we've been close. And he's now on a breathing machine, and his feet are swollen big. And, and they're broken open and a lot of pain. So my wife and I went up to see them here recently and stayed a about three days and cleaned out the garage and washed the cars and planted flowers and just visited. He's a man of the word and he can quote more of the Bible than any man I know personally. And he told me, he said, Ronnie, seek the face of God every day. At the end of your race is his face. So every day we seek the face of God. We focus in and we push everything aside so that we can see his face. There's just something in our nature that is hungering and thirsting for that relationship with Jesus Christ. There's something in our very nature. Man was made to only be at peace in the presence of God. Your conscience was made to only be at peace. It was designed by God and it will never be at peace anywhere but in the presence of God. If my right hand could represent God and my left hand could represent you, when you're in God's presence, there is peace. But when you get away from God's presence, there's a trembling in the soul. When you backslide, when you draw back from God, there is that until you get back at peace. There is no peace, saith God, to the wicked. It doesn't matter who the man is what status in life, if he's away from God, there is no peace, saith God. Only in God's presence is there peace. How many of you found that to be true? No matter how, what happens in your life, if you're away from God, you're away from your devotion, away from your meditation, if you're away from God, you are not at peace. If you ever decide to backslide, remember, there is no peace. If you ever decide to backslide, there is no peace. You may endure the pleasures of sin for a season, but you will never enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season because you're away from God. You will know every day that you're in sin, that you are not where you ought to be with God, and there is no peace, saith God, to the wicked. How many of you have found the peace that only comes in a relationship? Can you raise your hands and just thank Him for the peace that there is in the presence of God? I read a, an article recently by a theologian, Dr. Zohiatis, and he said that there is a pain that has never been described. It is so great, the intense of the pain is so deep that it has never been described by man. 
It has, there are a few insights in the scripture that lets us know the depth of the pain, such as Cain saying, my punishment is more than I can bear. David saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus saying that in outer darkness there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just a little insight into the pain that is the most severe pain that man has ever and shall ever experience. And that is the pain of a conscience that has been alienated from the presence of God. Your conscience was made to be at peace only in the presence of God. And when your conscience is alienated, when you hear those words, depart from me, ye work of iniquity, if you hear them, and God forbid that any of us would hear them, if you're ever separated from God, the pain of a conscience that has been alienated from God is the greatest pain that a mortal man can experience. Can everybody say, I love you, Jesus? Can we just raise our hands and love him? We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. All students of natural history know of the wonderful instinct of direction displayed by birds and beasts and fish. It is sometimes called the homing instinct. Cats and dogs often find their way back across wide stretches of unknown country. Pigeons fly directly to their homes hundreds of miles away. Seabirds carry around the coast from one side of England to the other, return unerringly, apparently straight over the land to the very cliff or burrow from which they were removed. Swallows and other migrant birds take a confident aerial journey between destinations thousands of miles apart. Salmon return to spawn in the rivers of their birth. Young eels still steer their way through a wide heaving ocean of hereditary waters which they have never seen. Nothing in all of nature is more wonderful than this amazing instinct of the lower creation for home. There's just something in our nature that is calling us back to our Creator. The question has been raised sometimes whether a man ever possessed the same homing instinct and lost it through the ages in his preoccupation with other things. It is easy to lose our focus and to lose that inner craving of our conscience and our soul to go back to God that made it. Paul said in our bodies we groan. We want the revelation of the sons of God. We desire, we desire to see him face to face. Other things come in view and have to be pushed aside. And every day we have to push things aside and seek his face because at the end we can never lose our focus. Our focus is Jesus. Our desire is Jesus. Birds and fish desire, their, their homing instinct is to go right back to that 
that place. And there is something in each of us that is longing, longing. I don't want the world to think that we're just excited about being a Christian today and all of us are totally excited. I mean, they're excited about being a Christian right now. But this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. There is nothing in this world that can take the place of our Jesus Christ and His face. We hope the world does not misunderstand us here in Lufkin this week. We are excited about Pentecost. We're excited about the Holy Ghost and revival. But deep, deep, deep down inside of us there is a longing, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. You are our soul's desire. You are what we seek every day. We seek your face. We love you with a passion. We are mesmerized by him. I have uh, had a few experiences of being homesick. And uh, at times I felt like going to the doctor and asking him, does he have any kind of medicine for my homesickness? I preached revivals for three years away from my family, and one of those years was the year of Eldridge's infancy, and he was sick, and oh, dear Lord, the homesickness and the letters I wrote. The postman would have to wear gloves to handle them. My love and my desire, my eyes were so hungry for those brown eyes of Jerry Ann, and I wanted to hold that little boy, and the affection was so tender, and if you go to the doctor and say, Doctor, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just sick. Well, where are you? I'm, I'm in Indiana. I'm preaching revival. You're sick. What's wrong? I can't sleep at night, and I feel I don't want to eat. And he'll say, well, son, there's only one cure for home homesickness, and that's home. There's only one cure for homesickness, folks. There's only one, there's only one thing that will satisfy the church of Jesus Christ. There is no substitute. Buddha will not... Confucius, nobody, everybody say nobody. He's the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is the desire of the ages. And there is no substitute, only Jesus. Only Jesus. You can delve into money markets, you can delve into politics, feed your mind with materialism, but there is still a void that only, would I say only, only Jesus. This camp meeting is about simply Jesus, renewing our relationship with each other and renewing our relationship with him. Can we raise our hands and love him again? We love you, Jesus. We're here to remind you afresh that there is no hero in this world. There is no king or potentate that has our affection and love and our devotion. Songwriters have written many songs about Jesus. Just to behold his face. You ever heard that song? Just to behold his face. 
just to behold his face all that I want up in heaven is just to behold his face. How many want to see his face? One songwriter said, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. Moses knew him face to face. We sing the hymn a lot, oh, I want to see him look upon his face. It's sort of hard right now for you to get in tune with me because we're living in a world that is obsessed with the 50 most beautiful people in the world. Always looking for pretty people, beautiful people to make millions of dollars on them. Hollywood is looking for people. We're in a world that is so people-oriented that it's sort of hard to come to a service and hear a preacher say, only Jesus can satisfy. Focus in on Him. Tune out the world. And, and we've come to church today. Isn't it hard sometimes to go to church and they're trying to praise singers or trying to get our minds off of the world? That's one of the biggest struggles uh, of praise worship is get people's minds off the world and let's focus in and turn our eyes on Jesus and get face to face with him and tune out the, the sins and the spirits of our age and just tune in to the Holy Ghost and it's sort of hard sometimes to just turn our eyes and seek his face because at the end of our race is his face. Would you like to stand with me right now and let's just raise both of our hands and talk to him face to face. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, let there be spirit to spirit and face to face. Hallelujah. Lord, let this camp meeting be impacted by your spirit, Lord. Let your Holy Ghost come down like torrents of rain. We seek you, Jesus. We hunger and we thirst. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, we love you, Jesus. Oh, there's a wonderful spirit of the Lord in this room this morning. Wonderful spirit of the Lord this morning. You may be seated. Men are longing to see the face of Jesus, and they go to extents to even try to pick up on the face of Jesus in the Shroud of Turin big promotion for the shroud. I think we ought to have a big promotion for his face. Hallelujah. To understand this inner desire, let's look at a few scriptures. Numbers 6 and 25, he said, The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. In Acts chapter 2, for David speaketh concerning him, he said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. We're, we're in an age where people are looking for angels. Angels. We're in an angel crave right now. And people are literally seeing angels, probably the fallen angels. They're looking around for all kind of angels. We're looking for the face of Jesus. 
not the shroud of Turin. We want to see him face to face. Come on, folks. We're going to focus this week. It's the face. We're focusing in. We want to get face to face. I read in a book where preaching was designed by God to bring people face to face with God. Preaching was designed to get focused, focus, push things aside. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Am I doing all right, Brother Lewis? Turn everything off but Jesus. Turn out everybody but Jesus. 10,000 voices are crying out heroes and sports heroes and world heroes. Get your mind off of those voices. There is a voice of Jesus in this world. There is a face of Jesus. David said, I foresaw the Lord always. Always his face. He kept his face before him. We can't lose our focus on his face. Paul said in Corinthians, we look through a glass darkly, but then face to face. How many like to be face to face with Jesus Christ? Face to face. With an open face, beholding as in a glass. 1 John 3 and 2 says, Beloved, now are ye the sons of God, but when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Deuteronomy 34, 6 through 10, and Moses, there was no prophet like him. God gave him the privilege of knowing him face to face. At the end of our race is his face. So we seek his face every day. Now there is no form nor comeliness about the face of Jesus. It's probably going to startle us when we see Jesus. Probably one of the reasons they crucified him was because he was not handsome and his face was not attractive, but yet he was proclaimed to be the king of Israel. And that turned off the religious world. It turned off the, the world of maniacs, where people get become maniacs for people. Jesus did not attract people because of his faith. Now, Jesus had a face that was not beautiful. Nobody will desire to see his face when it comes to natural beauty. I don't know if he had real long, lobby type ears or deep socketed eyes with wrinkles. One commentator said that when Jesus died, his body was as if it were the body of a 90-year-old man. He had been through agony and pain and his face was crazy. The face of Jesus is not beautiful. It's the stars that make him beautiful. Brother Lewis has a cousin named Jimmy, Dr. Jimmy Lewis, professor in Chattanooga University, that when Grandma Lewis was getting rid of the old upright piano. Jimmy had played that piano from a little cot and he would come to the farm to see Sister Lewis. And there were some teeth marks that he made when he was a one, two-year-old boy that was in right below the teeth and whenever they were deciding who would get that old piano, virtually worth maybe fifty, seventy-five dollars, Jimmy said, I want that piano. Because those are my teeth marks when I was a little boy. And it's not the brand of the piano, 
that makes it valuable. But it's those, those marks, those stars that make it beautiful. Last week I preached the funeral of a Green Beret, one of the top decorated soldiers from Vietnam, three tours. They dropped him behind enemy lines three times while gunshot was, was in the air. He picked rice among the enemies to detect their strength, radioed back to headquarters. He had two Purple Hearts, battle stars that he wore to his grave. He loved those battle stars. It just made his life meaningful. Now when you see Jesus, your natural eyes will probably cringe. Samuel told when he was viewing Eliab, Jesse's son, he told this. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on his height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. When you fall, when you see Jesus, don't fall out of love with him because he's not handsome and beautiful. Don't be shocked when you see Jesus. But the Bible says there is no form, no, no, no form, no common. He is not pretty. Physically, he's not pretty. In Isaiah 49, he, he said this to Israel in effort. Israel, there are times that you pray, and be between the prayer prayed and the prayer answered, you have a tendency, because I take my time, you have a tendency to say that the Lord has forgotten me. The Lord has forsaken me. How many of you have ever thought that yourself, that between the time you prayed a prayer and the time it was answered, that where is God? What happened to my telephone? What happened to my lines of communication? But he said, Israel, I can't forget you. Can a mother forget her child that she has nursed? Yes. And she gets aged and she gets senile, maybe Alzheimer's. She can forget a baby. But Israel, I can't forget you. Because Israel, he said, I have engraved you in the palm of my hand. My stars remind me of you and my love and my devotion for you. Jimmy did not want to get old English polished and rub out those stars because it's those stars that made that old worthless channel valuable to the heart. And in Zechariah 13, in prophecy, when the angels were greeting Jesus as he came through, they said, where did you get those prints in your head? Where did you get those prints? And evidently when Jesus walked to the throne, he still had those prints. 
his face still had the ugly scars where the crown of thorns was pressed down into his head. His hair was probably still just blotchy where the scars and the hair didn't grow back and his side probably that place where it was ribbon still there. He did not owe English over those scars. He did not heal those scars. It's probable when we get to heaven that all of our warts and moles and corns and calluses and bent fingers and twisted joints and arthritic uh, legs will be completely healed. I don't believe I'll see my crippled sister Gracie in a wheelchair. Probably healed and walking and rejoicing. But Jesus will still bear his scars. He did not feel those scars. those scars that make him so precious. It's the scars of Jesus that prove he saved that salvation. Do you want his scars to meet? Do we want him to just be some pretty Jesus that is like Hollywood stars, man looks on the outward appearance. But the truth is, our Jesus, there's none like him. You can't mistake him. In heaven, he will still bear his stars. If you could ask any of the saints, that are at his throne right now. What about his, what about his print? They have knelt there through the years and worshiped and praised and wept him, wept before his throne. Can you imagine what, what a beautiful sight of all the saints around the throne? It's sort of hard to get our mind off of this world for a while, but this morning, we have, a, we have a right to envision heaven, being with Jesus, being at the throne, being in his presence. There's no beauty in his face. Where they pluck his beard is probably craggly and, and pitted. His face is not smooth. There's, there's stars and there's chips and, and there's... Uh, Prince, and he bore in his body the price that he paid for our salvation. The end of our race is his faith. There are thousands of saints before him worshiping him, not because he's pretty, but ask them about his prince. If I could ask my dad this morning, Dad, you've been at this throne now about uh, about 13 years. The verse of scripture I heard you preach more frequently from down through the years of my boyhood days was the scripture that said there's no form no coming. I heard him preach that over and quote that scripture over and over. But dad, not 13 years you've been face to face. What about his print? Pretty print, boy. A pretty print. But guess what paid for me to get here? What about his stars, Dad? Pretty stars, Ronnie. Pretty stars. That's what paid. It wasn't my righteousness that got me here. It wasn't my goodness. 
stood aside for the plant to remind us forever that he paid the price for us to get there. Thomas said, I, I won't believe it's Jesus till I see him. Till I see the next guy. Thomas, when you touch him, Thomas, if you don't believe Jesus is God, just touch him. You touch him. You know he's the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We were designed to only be at peace in his presence. Who can measure the love of man? I have a friend whose son died, and his teenage son died in his bedroom, and whenever he died, the mother took a pair of his jeans, and she went in the bedroom, and on the bed where the boy died, she took those jeans, and she hugged them and in a seated position. She stayed for hours. She could measure the depth of love that she had for her child. Who can measure the depth of love Jesus has for his children? It's those stars that prove how much he loves them. Hungry eyes. Hungry in the eyes. How many want to see Jesus? How many long for his presence? John said in Revelation that the last days he would try even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. He is our soul's desire. We are mesmerized by him. We don't care what, what his face looks like. It doesn't matter how bruised and scarred he is. He is our Lord. He is our longing. There is nothing but his spirit that will satisfy our spirit. Only his presence will satisfy the homesickness that we have for him. Yesterday, my wife and I went to Freeport to pray for Little Saint to Darlene Ferris. She, a month ago, I went to her surgery. She has cancer, and and uh, now just uh, brother took the eggs and uh, mother took the eggs, and then I took her mother to the mother's mother, and uh, as sick as she is. And since she came home from the hospital, her little that tumor has drawn and she's so big and Sunday she was so sick, vomiting and dizzy and she said, Ed, Martha, I want to go to church. I'm sick, but I want to go to church. And Sunday they put her clothes on her and they brought her to church. And it's probably the last time she'll ever get to go to church. But, and I told her yesterday, I said, Mom, you know, it's, it's just amazing what church means to you. When she goes to church, it's always early and finds a place to pray because the depth of what it means, the depth of her devotion, the depth of her longing, the depth of her desire is only fulfilled only fulfilled. There are some people that only Jesus will satisfy that inner hunger. We're the people. So she went to church and then to the hospital. Probably the last time. Who can measure the depth of love that he had for us? 
He can measure the depth of love that we as people have for him. For we seek his faith. Because at the end of our race is his faith. Nothing matters but his faith. Put it in, Jesus. Put it down. Don't polish over those stars, Lord. Leave them there to remind us through the speechless ages. It was your Christ that got us there. Yeah. It was your sacrifice that got us there. Yeah. I didn't want to see it. Oh, I want to see look up on his face. your face this morning. We seek your face this morning. We worship you. We are only at peace when we're in your presence, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. We push everything outside this world, the pleasures of the world. Only you, Jesus. Praise his name. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for and his wonderful things and the things of earth will grow straight in the light of his glory morning, I'd like to invite you to gather in and stand a moment around if you'd like to be anointed with oil. Be healed this morning. The wonderful presence of God here this morning. We push everything aside but Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Face to face with you. We'd like to get in and we sing this morning. And your eyes upon Yeah. 
strongly on my mind this morning. I'm reminded of a little story that I think might be appropriate. A little blonde-headed girl came into a home. She grew up in two and other children were inviting her mother to their school activities. But she would never, ever tell her mother about the anything that would bring them out in the public together. So you see, she was ashamed of her mother's appearance. She didn't understand the tender, young, and innocent. Her mother never burdened her with the weight of that which she was ashamed of. For her hands were horribly scarred, deformed. The little girl grew on. Folks inquired about her mother. What was her mother like? Some of her little friends. But as she grew into a young lady, her mother then thought it was time that I could share with you the reason why my hands were deformed. When you were just a small infant, I had caught fire. Please like, comment, and subscribe.